Well, welcome back, everyone, or welcome to the after church as we um, um, begin to spend, huh? The, the after church party, that's right. So you're missing a great party here. So, <laughs> But no, um, we're, we're grateful that uh, I know that some of you kind of rush home and then they watch this live. Others of you will be seeing it sometime in the future. And then, of course, there are some of you who are here. You're looking at me quizzically. Yes, ma'am. Excuse us, please. Oh, never mind. I've got to turn my thing off. Great. Um, excuse. That was a high-level decision that needed to be made. Um, so uh, let's let's begin by, if you if you listen to, to to this morning's message, you know that that was supposedly a joke. But um, let's let's stay, I know. Let's start out by praying. Yeah, as as most of my jokes do. That's the reason I don't try them. I I, I don't I don't try to be funny because I never am. Um, so let's pray. Um, Father, as we spend a few minutes now uh, at the end of this time of worship to dig deeper into your word. And my goodness, we have such depth that uh, Luke has just collected in one real tiny, very compressed set of verses, some of the primary uh, foci of all of Scripture, certainly of uh, the New Testament. So um, as we dig deeper into that, I pray that you, you will bring to mind the questions that I left unanswered, uh, that you would give me the discernment of the wisdom to answer them, and that um, beyond that, we would be able just, just to dig a little bit deeper into each one of these. And we give you the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, as far as... Um, um, what I'd like to, well, first of all, just, just feel the questions. So that, that's where we kind of start off. So questions, thoughts that you might have had that we can start the conversation. And then if, 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 if we can, I'd like to go deeper into each one of these stories, parables, proverbs, whatever. So are there any, any yes, ma'am. Um, you said to make sure you're following a follower. Uh, what happens or what should you do besides praying for them, obviously? Um, if the person that you are following, have been following, um, or maybe even is in authority over you, is not showing signs of being a follower anymore. Um. It's okay. I mean, it's a good. It's a good question because there, 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 there's no easy answers to that, other than um, the, the straightforward. The, the Lord has given us means by which we can determine the spiritual fruit that someone is bearing. The very next passage, the very next thing that Luke is going to bring up is. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is grown by its own fruit, or known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Okay? So you, you can see where he's headed, right? He, he anticipated your question. All the 2,000 years ago, he, he knew what you were going to ask. But, um, uh, but, but, but you get the point. And the point is that we tend, because of our human fallenness, we tend to seek the gray, where the Lord has delivered things in pretty much black and white. Okay? Now, the reason that's a hard question, and, and let me just create a scenario that it's not your scenario, I'm creating it based on your question. Um, you're following a, a, a leader, a teacher, a, a, a preacher. And in the early stages, he's turned on, he's reading the word, he's, he's 
uh, uh, the infallible word. I mean, he's teaching, he's transparent. He, he is what you would want him to be. But then something happens. And, and actually, in quite a few leaders, it has happened. When all of a sudden, circumstances take a turn. And something like the homosexual gender issue comes up or critical race theory comes up and the church tries to figure out how to deal with it and there's a blind spot in your leader and and okay there's a blind spot because all these years he said we have to stay true to scripture you know we have to you know the word of god is the word of god and all of a sudden you start hearing things like well then there's genetic evidence and scientific evidence and there's the cultural evidence and we just have to kind of adjust our thinking according to that. Now that's exactly where our denomination is right now. Uh, our, our denomination, they were bulldogs. I mean for all those years they split from the RCA because of some very minor things because they were scriptural bulldogs. But now we're seeing them on that slippery slope, making horrible decisions as a new generation, and they are straying from the path they've always held. Okay, still calling themselves Calvinists, still talking about the gospel, still talking about Jesus, still talking about all those things, but making terrible decisions. Something that's going to force us into a decision real soon. But so that's that's kind of it's probably not the exact example you're thinking of, but it's kind of the same example. What do you do? Well. <clears throat> There is grace. Remember what Jesus said just earlier. He says, judge not, and you won't be judged. Condemn not, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. So he's really spelled it out. Because each time he said that, what did he say? What benefit is that to you? Or what grace? In other words, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. What grace is there into you? What grace have you received? Are you not going to give that same grace to others who might just be struggling with an issue? You know what I mean? They they might be struggling with an issue and they may come out the other side. And and so you have to give grace there and you have to give time there. Our our, our Lord is very patient and very gracious and and, and shows mercy upon those who don't require mercy or, or, or don't merit mercy. That's the, that's the definition of mercy. So we, it, it's, it, it's like it's not a simple answer. Okay, they've strayed. Cut them off. Give them an opportunity. And again, Scripture in Matthew 18 tells us. Confront them. You know something? What are we going to do with this? Because you're, you're straying. You're taking this focus, and I can't go there. I, I, I can't see it that way. What are you going to do? And, and try to work it out according to scriptural guidelines. But, but ultimately, uh, as he just says, or is he about to say, you're going to know a fruit tree by its fruit. You know? and, and if the fruit's all of a sudden not there, and it, it's, it's, you, you, you thought it was there at one time, then you have the big question, well, how can someone with such good fruit all of a sudden start bearing such evil fruit? And that's why, once again, you have to go to Scripture, and John says, if they went out from us, they were never one of us. And the world is full of false teachers and false prophets and false doctrines, and they are, some of them believe in their hearts that they are actually sent by God to do what they say they're to do. And just because you say you're sent by God does not mean you're sent by God. In fact, the more someone says they're sent by God, I think the less, at least I'm, I'm a little skeptical that way. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Deborah. The school and you have an appointment. I didn't hear all of it because we don't hear, I don't hear you very good in the back. One okay. behind you. <clears throat> Pause. Pause. Let's. Go shift gears here for for a second and and talk about something completely different. (laughs) It's okay. Yeah, I told you. I I honor all questions. Um, All right. We have just, over the last week, a week ago on Saturday, the elders and the leaders of the school, 
all of Brandy's leadership team met at this new property. Um, the only reason we know that this property is there is because frantic parents began calling us about a, a, a month ago stating that my school closed down, they gave me a week's notice, and I have no idea where to send my child. And so they're trying to get in our school. That's the only reason. It's not on the market, okay? They literally closed their doors, giving everybody a week, and locked the doors and left. Everything is there. All the, well, they took the servers out, but everything besides there, all the desks, all the chairs, all the lunchroom tables, you name it, it's all sitting there. Even the printers that they still have a lease on are, are there. So in other words, it's, it's, we could move right in and, and we would not have to lose, we're, we're gonna lose four grades or four classes come August because we've been using their gym and they're not gonna let us use it anymore. They're, they have their own needs. So we're gonna literally lose, have to send children go someplace else. We can't, we can't accommodate you. So this is to us a, a tremendous opportunity and there it is. Very expensive, very expensive. It, it, they'll either accept a lease or a purchase. So we, we gave them what is called a letter of intent, okay? Um, we're working through a realtor who we know. He's a Christian man. We've worked with him before. He's always looking for the benefit of, of us, willing to do a lot of work for us without actually ever being paid for it, you know, with different members who are in need. Um, but he's putting it together. We put together a letter of intent um, uh, as far as what we were willing to do, which is a combination lease purchase. In other words, we lease it, but we have six months to try to buy it. Okay, um, if we can come up. So I scheduled a congregational meeting in two weeks because we have to give two weeks notice to call a congregational meeting. And so I'm, I'm just doing, we may cancel it. You know, if it doesn't work out, we'll cancel it. But in other words, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to present you with the, the details. Um, it's too early, a, a letter of intent is just a letter. You know, it's, it's not, we don't actually, no money, and it's no contract, you know. That'll come later. So it just, it just, with business properties, they tell me this is the way that you do it because it gives you the opportunity to banter back and forth without filling out big, huge contracts each time. You know, you, come, you agree on, okay, basically this is what we'll do, and then, then we put it in a bid. Um, well, here's the situation in our school. It's really, if, if you look at the situation that exists in, in Broward County, it's amazing. Um, we've seen three or four Christian schools go out of business over the last couple of years, okay? We have waiting lists in almost every class. Um, we're turning kids away already for next year, okay? We, we, we've closed registration for next year because we have no place to put them. If we didn't have our elementary and now middle school kids over here, we could literally double our preschool tomorrow because we have that many people who want to send their children here. And, and part of the reason is the kind of school that they have, they've, they've accomplished, the fact that we're academically excellent, the, the kids are, are, are learning, um, we, we teach a classical education, you know, not the progressive education at all, and, you know, whether it's an outreach school, so that means it's not covenantal, so that means that parents who want their kids, there aren't Christians, to get a solid moral backbone, where do they go? And pretty much there's no non-covenantal Christian school other than Rio Vista Community, Bethany, but they only go to the eighth grade. So literally, Come ninth grade, there's no place to send a non-Christian kid except public school or charter school. So therefore, given the times um, and the place of where we are and not seeing this change in, of course, the Lord's the one who sees around the corner, and that's why we pray on every single step. But not just looking at the trends, it's not going to get better <laughs> before it gets worse. You know, I mean, now they're discovering not only gender closets, but gender clubs, transgender closets and clubs in uh, all these public schools, hidden from the parents. 
I mean, fully sexually explicit books and literature in the libraries, you know, and the parent tries to read it to the school board, and the school board shuts them down and makes them leave. But it's in the schools. My, my child can read this. You don't want to hear it? You know, that, that kind of thing. And we're seeing that. And, and where do parents send their children when they're faced with that? So uh, we, we feel that given the space that we're, 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 we're not going to suffer it, 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 in, in making a decision that could not be financially um, um, lived up to. So we would keep this here. Um, uh, Miss Brandy has decided that what she's going to do with the sixplex is because we're having trouble moving it in, is they're going to sell their house and move into it. Um, <laughs> she's going to turn each room into an apartment for teachers. And we've already had two of our teachers say they're going to sell their house and move in, you know. Uh, we can charge them rent, you know. <sighs> what? So probably not. <laughs> but anyway, yes, ma'am. Well, it's uh, right on the other side of commercial on Prospect. If you take Prospect and it crosses commercial and then it turns. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's on 21st, right on the corner. There's commercial on one side and they're building $500,000 homes on the other side. Okay, so it's a, a whole new neighborhood, a whole new area. So, and it's beautiful. It literally is beautiful. It used to be a church. Okay, I'm glad to hear that because you can tell because it's got enough parking for the stadium. doesn't have as much parking as this place has. Wow. It was a Korean United Methodist Church, and then um, Christian Life Center took it over and turned it into educational. Yeah. It's Christian Life Center? Uh, not to my knowledge. It was a charter school. Well, at one time they did yeah. have it. I don't know if it, in the last few years they might have yeah. turned it over. I mean, what, what I've been told, and I don't know any of the specifics, is that it was a charter school, and apparently those who run charter schools can just say, I'm tired of this, I want to quit. And that's what happened. I I'm tired of this, I want to quit. And so it closed their doors. It would be New Hope Christian two, number two. Well, it would be New Christian school. You know, yeah, we're jumping way ahead. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can't tell you all the specifics, but it definitely is New Hope Christian School. Um, we have enough space. There's 22 classrooms there we, and a cafeteria and, and you know, a, a lot of space. We have enough space to go all the way up to 12th grade. Little prayer things and let's start getting yeah. them <laughs> That's the whole, that's the, that's the reason the elders met just a few minutes ago. We are, we are dedicated as elders that every single step that we take, we're going to submit it to the Lord in prayer. And that's what we just did. So, yes, we need to, to be praying for that. Again, oh, it makes so much good sense to me, Lord. You know, ask me and I'll tell you what to do. You know, but he doesn't ask me. And, and as one of the elders prays, his ways are not our ways. And so we, we know that... He can see around the corner, and around the corner, there could be a horrible pitfall. So we're going to follow him, okay? And if he leads, then we'll do it. Yes, ma'am. You think that this is why there's been such a delay on... Everybody's already figured that out. Decided. They have already figured out God's plan and purpose. They have it down. Yeah. Absolutely, they have it completely down, and I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be, you know, let's not get, let's not let our enthusiasm drive us, let's allow the Lord to lead, and so actually when we, when, and, and receive some really good counsel, you know, um, informing the bid, or the, what we offered to pay, we went low, and the, 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 the wisdom was, you know something, if it's God's will, let God be God, you know? And so, you know, me, I'm thinking, no, it's too low. We don't want to go to you're going to upset and throw it in the garbage can. Um, but it's not. The, the, the realtor says it's very respectable, okay? The whole thing is very respectable. Um, so we'll just pray. We'll just pray that this Lord's will. Yes, ma'am. Um, just so you know, I'm, like, studying for the, to be a child care um, teacher. 
So, uh, just see them. So, in other words, we need to go ahead and buy the school no matter what it is so you have a place to teach. Okay, I got you. Yes. And even the hall bathroom. Oh, wow. The hall bathroom. The teachers, when we had the leaders there, they were salivating because they actually had teacher bathrooms. You know? Uh, yeah, really. You know, so it, it's, it's amazing. But anyway, completely wired, uh, 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 completely camered, uh, the whole I mean, literally, it, it's turnkey. We, we could, two weeks or, or three weeks, clean up, it, we could move in. Okay. Um, given what I just went through with our copy machines, no way. Take your copy machine away. Absolutely. Abs I j don't, even, don't even start. <laughs> don't even get me on that subject. I just paid. I could buy for what I just paid to get out of a lease. Okay? I could buy two a year. You know, two brand new ones a year. It, it, come on. But, but, but anyway. That's what I did. But I'm not going to tell you how much I spent on it. Yes, lease, any, anybody who leases things, you just need to remember that as long as you turn the lease over, everybody's happy because they just factor it into your price. It's when you stop, they kill you, okay? They kill you. They don't want to lose you. All right, maybe we can get back to subject. Um, anybody have any questions about the sermon, you know, uh, what, what we're talking about here? Yes, ma'am. Um, as far as the spec goes, um, I think we're always going to, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, we're always going to see lots of specs in our own eyes. And, uh, you know, it, is Jesus saying that we should, before we, we talk to another believer about the fact that we think they might be engaging in something that they shouldn't, do we have to just have a clean slate or or, or just recognize our, our um, shortcomings? That's a great question. Well, if we needed a clean slate, then you give it up because you're never going to have one. You're, you're never going to be righteous. You're never going to be the Pharisee in the temple who is so sold on his righteousness. You know, the interesting thing about this, and, and this is sort of the dilemma that we as Christians find ourselves in, and, and I'll, I'll default to Dr. Kennedy who told this story on several occasions. You know, he's driving down the beach, and a scantily clad woman walks in front of his car while he's at the, at the, um, uh, the, 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 the light. And he turns his head and doesn't look at her, okay? So then he is so proud of himself for not looking at the, 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 the woman. And then he realized, I just committed a far worse, far more egregious sin than if I actually did watch her walk by because pride, I, I just was proud of myself. So the problem that we as Christians find ourselves in, we all like affirmation, don't we? We all like people to say, good job, well done. But when they do that, almost immediately, we puff up. You know, we, we start thinking, well, maybe they're right. Maybe, I, you know, I did do a great job, you know. But at the same time, we're, we're, we're told to encourage each other. So on the one hand, we encourage each other. And on the other hand, that instills a self-righteousness in ourselves. That's the reason we have to constantly be introspective. That's the idea that Luke is putting forward to us, is that the only way we're going to do any of this is that we're constantly monitoring our behavior. Now, the world would tell you that's totally negative. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to weigh yourself down with oppressive negative thoughts, you know. You need to be positive, you know. You, you, you are whatever you say. You, I mean, you know, preachers actually make a lot of money off of the, the sayings like that. You know, your best self now, or whatever it is. You know, you be, be what you want to be, just name it, and then you be it, you know. 
Oh, that's opposite if, if you're saying, wait a minute, um, I'm feeling really good about myself right now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the way that went. Well, are you getting puffed up? And, and so therefore, do you not need to, to look at yourself? I know I'm not answering your question yet, but I am winding my way around to it, okay? Um, because this is a natural event for all of us. We, we get proud when we, when we are not looking at ourselves next to the, the standard to which we're called. And that's the reason it's important that we compare ourselves in our introspection to that standard. So, to get back to your question now. When someone has an obvious speck in their eye, what do you have to do? Well, there's two things that you should do. First, ask yourself, Am I doing the same thing? Okay, I, I'm, I'm noticing something in them. But then the introspective and what Jesus says clearly is how can you help the person get the speck out of their eye if you're oblivious to the log in your own eye? Now, I didn't spend as much time on that aspect of the parable because I was really pointing out that, you know, how it was different from Matthew's than in Luke. But the idea is that the person who has the log in their eye is blind as a bat because you've got a log in your eye. How can you see anything if you have a log in your eye? So you cannot clearly discern the, the state of someone else who's got the speck. So therefore, get the log out of your eye first because you need to recognize that, first of all, that you are a sinner just as them and that even though it may not be evident to you, and on the front, in thought, word, or deed, omission, commission, in the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, and the implicit inverse of the law, whatever it is that they're breaking, guess what? You're guilty. And so, as Paul says, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. So therefore, who are you to judge your brother or sister in that way? So that's the one idea. You look at yourself and you say, am I guilty flagrantly of that same sin? But then it's even beyond that when we start talking about the sin of pride and self-arrogance. Because if you're looking down your nose at someone, and again, Jesus is talking about what's going on in your heart. The motives of the heart are everything. So if you're looking at someone with that self-righteous, you know, the Pharisee in the temple, then your sin is so far greater than the, 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 the sin that whoever is committing because your sin is the sin of pride, which I forget who said it. I wanted to say that Spurgeon said it. Well, somebody said it's like the prince of, of, of sins. It, it's like the, the greatest sin of all of them is the sin of pride. And I think that's the reason it's the log, you know, because it is the, the sin that God truly, truly hates, that sin of pride. So therefore... You examine yourself first, okay, to see who you are in a sense you judge yourself. And, and, and then when you come alongside your brother and sister, again, it doesn't stop where we normally stop. It doesn't stop, which, which is where the culture would like us to stop, which is don't judge me. Don't notice the speck in my eye. Well, if, if that's all that Jesus was talking about, he wouldn't have ended this the way that he did. He said, get the beam out of your own eye so that you can help your brother or sister out with the speck in theirs. Never says ignore it or leave it or don't say anything to him. It's look at yourself first, but then come along beside them with true Christian love and a desire to help rather than judgmental self-righteousness. Motive is everything. Okay? Yes, ma'am. It came into my mind about someone with a log in their eye. And, like, maybe, like, someone taps them on the shoulder to tell them, hey, you have a big log in your eye. And they'll be like, yeah. And then, like, hitting them <laughs> with the log, you know? <laughs> it just, like, shows, like, how that pride, like, hurts other people around yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> And that's the, the danger that we're in because most people with logs in their eyes, as Jesus says, aren't, aren't looking at themselves, so they're not aware of it. 
So yeah, you whip around to see who has the... the Saturday, you had a comment. Uh, actually, I don't know. Do you think um, that also have to do with the church body? I say the church, um, I don't know, like the whole movement of the church. Do you think that law have to do with the church body that sometimes in the church we focus on the word so much? that actually we don't really do the inside evaluation of ourselves sometimes. Do you think? Now you're getting down to the core. You're, you're getting down to the nitty gritty. Okay, uh, let me answer that. Great question. Everybody get the question? Uh, how, does this not in some way also deal with the body of the church it, it, itself in the way that the body works with each other. Well, the answer is yes, I definitely think he's thinking about the body because I think whenever you talk about Christians, two Christians, remember, he starts this out by saying, brother, let me help you get the back out of your own eye. So obviously it's the brotherhood of disciples in his day of the church in our day. So definitely he's talking about the church. Whenever you talk about two individual Christians, I think in, in scripture, you can just multiply that and talk about the body, okay, because we're a, 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 an organization of Christians. So therefore, can bodies be judgmental, puffed up, self-righteous, and arrogant? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, what's unfortunate is that quite often it's the members that work on each other that build them up that way and quite often, they're being led by someone who is not following Jesus, someone who might be a, you know, really charismatic, very gifted, very, I mean charismatic in the sense not of, of charismatic gifts, but as being a really great personality, really able to, to, to lead people um, just by the power of their personality. And, and quite often, you see this sort of, arrogance in the leader and you talk with the rest of the folks in the church and boy they have that same arrogance in fact that's what i think jesus means here when he says that in the 41st verse the disciple is not above his teacher but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher okay if you go to a church that teaches that the bible is a bunch of Hebrew myths put together by a Zionistic self-determining group of people who wanted to justify their takeover of, uh, of, of Canaan, um, and, and that it wasn't the word of God, but that there's good stuff in it. There's really good lessons that you need to learn, but don't take any of it seriously. Don't take the virgin birth or the walking on water or the raising from the dead. Don't get any of that seriously because that kind of stuff doesn't happen. But, you know, when Jesus says, uh, you know, love your enemies, that, that's a good ethical standard. Of course, Jesus would be the worst, most egregious liar on earth and not worth listening to because he said, I'm the son of God. But probably that was his disciples that wrote that in. So you see, if you go to that kind of church and, and, and there's arrogance with the way that that is said, chances are the body is going to be arrogant as well. But if you go to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church with humble leaders who are following Christ, then hopefully the congregation is going to also learn that humility is hugely important, and they're going to be more humble themselves, and they're going to be more introspective themselves when they see somebody within the body who needs help. Instead of going and pounding on them themselves, well, maybe they, they also go to the elders and say, what should I do when I have this situation? You, you see, so whatever is being taught in the church is going to kind of uh, uh, determine the, the, the nature, the tenor of that body. Now, when that happens, and I can tell you this from experience, when that happens, and that is what the, the congregation is, is trying to do, Satan keeps planting people. He keeps bringing them. He keeps bringing people who could derail that and, and, and bring them from inside the church. Because that kind of a church is pretty well 
they're ready for the onslaught from outside, but it's the onslaught from inside that gets them because we're not looking for people who use the name of Christ and use the gospel and use all the vernacular, but really what they have in mind is building their own little fiefdom. And that's happened more than a few times. So yes, the body, you, 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 can, you can look at the body uh, uh, very much as part of this because I think any of the lessons that we have as Christians individually applies in one sense to the body as well because that's what we are. We're a bunch of Christians. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, now I'm understanding that this message was to believers. And Jesus said, now we're, we're in a world where um, people are always yelling at us, saying those words, and we just said, uh, don't, you know, you're judging us. And, uh, and so what is the response exactly back to the people who are non-believers when, you, when they say that to you? Do not judge, will she also be judged? Jesus would like me more than you like you? You yeah. know, it's one of those kinds of things that, that we hear all the time. Um, I, 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 the first thing that I would do, I, I tend not to, let me re- rephrase what I was just going to say. Um, I tend not to argue with people who are fideistic in what they're saying. In other words, they're, it just means that I'm stating something to state it. Uh, it's true because I said it. Okay? So what I would question the person who says to me that judge not let so you also be judged, I would say, okay, so you've read the Bible. And you've studied that through, have you? Oh, well, no, I've never read it. Why should I read it? Well, then you just quoted something to me that you've taken out of context in Scripture and you're acting as if I should respond to you the way that you said it to me, because you've totally twisted it around. Now, if you would like to know what it actually says, I'd be more than happy to tell you. And then I would go right back to the gospel, because I would start with the real, real problem is the fact that we're all sinners and God is holy, and that we're condemned because he's holy. So he's not telling us not to judge or discern or recognize sin when we see it, that he is actually telling us to be discerning. But see, the real problem that you have is that it's not with me. It's not with me judging you. Your problem is with God judging you, okay? And God doesn't say to himself, judge not. In fact, we can go through Scripture. I can show you many places that God says that he will condemn the guilty, okay? And that, you know, uh, on and on. And Jesus condemned the guilty. So in other words, when dealing with the world out there, I'm not going to say it, it's, it, there, there's, well, there's not one formula that works in every instance. But when I read someone like Peter, and I go into his first epistle, and I read his approach, almost everything he says is hard-lined, black and white, but he turns it into an opportunity to share the gospel. In other words, very unpopular. He says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. Okay, very, very unpopular. But then he comes right behind it and says, because who knows, you might be able to lead him to Christ. You see? So he's always turning whatever situation we find ourselves in with an unsaved culture to how can I turn this into the gospel? Okay, I can fight you all day long, but I keep wanting to use the wrong words. Um, you're not smart uh, as far as... <laughs> As the scriptures are concerned, you're talking about something you don't know. So why should I argue with you? Why should I try to convince you that what you're saying is wrong when you don't have the foggiest idea what scriptures say? But let me sort of, in, in EE, we used to call this the judo technique. You know anything about judo? You know, you, you use someone else's force against them. Instead of hitting them face on, they come charging at you. You just roll over and throw them. That, that, that's the whole concept of judo is to use someone else's force against them. So somebody comes at you, you're judgmental, you know, you, you don't, don't judge me. Oh, so you've taken the time to study the Bible. Where did that come from? R- remind me the reference uh, of that. Ooh. Have you read the Bible? Have you studied what you just took something out of the Sermon on the Mount? Have you studied that? No. Well, then let me tell you what it says, okay? Huh? Well, then you quiz them, 
it, it, you, you, you can learn really quickly whether somebody actually, now, what, where, where that falls apart, where that falls apart is the preacher's kid who has denied the faith. And they start whipping off things at you, okay? So, so then you, 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 oh, well, good. We can have an intelligent conversation about this because you know the scripture. So if you know the scripture, you know that that's not what Jesus meant. He's talking about judgmentalism. That's why it's so important that you know what that passage means so that you can explain it. Okay. Great. Yes, sir. For me, I think, like, what is Lord been teaching me like, the past few, you know, time, this past few months is, there's a verse in the reality, right? And it says, uh, blessings are your eyes, you can see, you can hear, you can hear. And it says, many prophets and righteous, you know, long to see the dead. But, and, and, and it's something that the Lord already been teaching me about it. The judgment, I think sometimes I can come out with the judging people sometimes. And I think one of the things the Lord been teaching me is, is it, like you said, like to, to discern because like, how I judge is not actually judging people, but how I know who is really following Christ and who is not really following Christ is using that, that word like my ears mm -hmm. and my eyes see and my ears hear what those people are really about. Mm -hmm. And then I can make my judgment if, if, you know, like, are they part of, you know, like, are they part of the Bible or are they part of are they, are they taking, are they following the way of Christ, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, like, as a Christian, I think our responsibility is, is to always, um, is to always, like, there's a verse, I don't know where it's in that, but there's a verse that in the Bible, it says, he who is coming is coming quickly, but we don't fight that way. And he talking about, I think he's, I think maybe we can say more of that. You can talk more about that. I have to show which. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if it's in that Zion or one of you, but he said he will come in quickly, but, um, but we we don't, we we shall not fight back, you know, and I think I'll write out. But it's like the word is changing very quickly. And I think what I'm first is talking about as a body is not our responsibility to fight back, but it's our responsibility to make the gospel attractive. So those that do not so that they will see and become to want to come to our side. Right. You know, and I well, think there's, there's, there's um, once again, we're talking in broad vagaries where each individual situation requires its own discernment. And that's the key word is to be able to discern what to do in what in which um, a situation because for instance you can go and you can find some of the things that Paul would say and you, it, unless you're careful to put it into the context in which he's talking then you can actually have him saying exactly the opposite of what he was saying because at the same time especially Jesus would say you know be merciful because your father in heaven is merciful and he is kind to both the ungrateful and the evil at the same time, he'll turn right around and says, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You know, you, you travel across land and sea to make it a, a one single proselyte and make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Literally calls them the sons of the devil when he talks to them. So on one hand, he says, yeah, mercy and grace is needed. But on the other hand, in a different situation, he's saying, no, you guys have crossed the line you're messing with the gospel. You're messing with the message of God. And so therefore, it is my responsibility to call you out. So in one sense, it's my responsibility to share the gospel. In another sense, it's my responsibility to call you out. And that's the discernment that takes place at the time. But always using, we, we, we have a guide. And the scripture is our guide. And we always default that. That's why you hear me say it so many times. I know ad nauseum over and over again, drilling the same point home. But you see, the tendency is away from Scripture. The tendency is that I, I'm going to interject myself into this decision rather than saying, okay, let me go back to Scripture and see what it says about this, all right, as best as I can. Where discernment comes in 
is where Scripture doesn't explicitly spell it out for you. So you have to use the broader principles of Scripture in order to be able to make the right decision. And that is why God has chosen to have churches elect elders because God actually works through them as a body in a different way than he works through individuals because he's the one who established that. Okay. So yeah, no, those, are, those, th those are times of tremendous discernment because you know, sometimes you need to stand up and you know, uh, other times you need to be full of grace. And I can say the same thing in two different senses and people will look at me and say, Pastor Kirby, you just contradicted yourself. Well, no, I didn't. I'm, I'm just being scriptural. Yes, ma'am. Paul said, shall we sin? Because um, in Romans, when he says, oh, like in Romans 7 or 6, he mm -hmm. says, shall we sin? Because of this, this, and that. Somebody could read that and then say, Paul said that. Shall we well, sin? Like, yeah, you know, actually, they, they, they have. There was a whole group of people. You, you know, in, in Revelation, when Jesus talks about the Nicolaitans, okay? They were probably what is known as antinomians, antinomos, against the law. Nomos is the law. Antinomians mean, they were actually saying this, well, it's a good thing when God forgives me because his grace is shown. So therefore, the more I sin, the more grace he shows, right? So let me sin all I want to, carnal Christianity. We've taken that up today. But Paul says, may it never be. You know, may, may it never be that we sin putting God to the test. Because no, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about sanctification that follows your salvation, you know, or follows your redemption. So yeah, uh, you could easily take some of the things that Paul says. And you could take it right out of context and you can use it for both sides. That's why it is said that every heretic has his or her favorite verse. You know, they're, they're using Scripture. And, and they're pulling Scripture into it, and they'll, they'll expound upon it, and they'll have great illustrations, and they'll act like they really know what they're talking about. But you, 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 you get ended, ending up in a pit because the blind leaves the blind. Well, great. Um, uh, any, any more questions? Because we pretty much covered most of what, uh, most of what I, I, I wanted to, co to cover, um, except for one thing. So let me just kind of end, end on this. Um, I find the, the little statement that Jesus says sandwiched in between the statement of, let's be careful, the blind will lead the blind and send them into the pit, and... Let's also be careful because pride is going to puff you up, and that's the worst thing. That's the log in your eye, and that I don't want you to ignore the speck in your brother or sister's eye, but you're not going to be able to take it out as long as you're so full of pride. And then in the middle, he says this, and again, I just go back to it and reread it for you. In the 41st verse, he says, The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. And if there is one thing that we need to remember out of this, brothers and sisters, is that that is our calling, to be like our teacher. Never to improve upon what he says. Never to subtract from what he says. Never to lead ourselves, but always to be like our teacher. Now, where we miss this and where it so often is missed, and this is why I said as part of the, the, the coming to the end of the message that one of the things I want to really impress upon you is don't be in a hurry to be a leader. Don't be in a hurry to lead in your church because Jesus says this takes training. If you are going to absorb the light. I mean, you, you, you can be a child and absorb the light. You can come to know Jesus as a child. But when you begin to say, no, I'm going to start being a leader. I'm going to teach scripture. Well, James, of course, says you need to be careful. Don't even aspire to this on your own because you're going to be held to a higher standard. So therefore, like Jonah, when I got called to be a preacher, I ran in the other direction. I, I don't want to be a preacher. I, I, I need to be called back kicking and screaming. 
you know, and, and, and with no chance, Paul says, if I don't preach, I die. If, if, if I don't preach, I know that I'm, not, I'm going against what God's calling on my life is. But he had to drag me. It took him a year to convince me that, that that's what he wanted me to do. And that entire year, I'm saying, I don't want to do it. I've got trips to China planned. Are you kidding me? You know, I, I'm, I've got all these places and people that want us to come and make videos for them. This is exciting. I don't want to be a, a preacher. So I was pulled into this kicking and screaming. That's the way I think. And I, I don't think that we should all try to resist the Lord. But I, I think that you, you, you take a seat at the far end of the table. Jesus even says that. Sit at the back. Take the least honorable seat and wait for someone to ask you to come forward because one of the things that in a church if the elders are properly called and properly trained as we try to here then one of the things that they're doing is looking for your spiritual fruit looking to see what that fruit is and and how that fruit could be used within the body the particular church that you're in so actually the elders are actually looking and the one thing that they're going to they're, they're bounce back is, is, hey, the Lord called me to lead. The Lord called me to, and, and again, I can always tell it, it's usually like the third Sunday, or, you know, second or third Sunday, they'll stop me and say, you know something, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you about, about what God has put on my heart, what God wants me to do here. He wants me to lead. He wants me to do this or do that. And I used to say, oh, wow, great. Thanks for the new resources you've sent, Lord, until I've had a couple of crash and burns. And now it's like, mm, you know, red flag. And we'll, 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 we'll talk about it. And usually if they can't do what they want to do, they leave because they're looking for something that they're not going to find. So don't be in a hurry to be a leader. Let the Lord develop you and graduate you himself. Okay? All right, let me leave it there. Um, that's enough, and we will um, continue with this next week and looking at some of the fruit that the Lord asks us to look out for. So let me pray, and I'll let you go. Heavenly Father, I, 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 once again, I just love the way that you encapsulate the, the lessons that you give us, that we can read Matthew, and we can come away from the exact same story but a different take, because even though the words are almost identical, Luke has, has put it in a different perspective. And so you teach us one thing in Matthew and another thing in Luke, and another thing in John, another thing in Mark, another thing in the rest of the Scripture. So it's all tied together beautifully with no conflicts. Only you could do that. And so we're very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for these people who are either watching or, or, or come to be part of this discussion. I pray that you will bless them. Um, and bless them as they go home. And, and once again, I just think about Norma with a broken arm, Lord. And we ask that you would comfort her and that uh, she wouldn't be in much pain as she recovers. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Lord bless you.